morning, people. I hope you're doing well with my delovelies. And with that well, let's talk grab wells. They may contain science. The physicists are getting giddy about something. Cosmological discoveries can be tough to drum up hype for, the details are often hard to understand, and big picture discoveries about the workings of our universe sometimes enable applied technological advances, but for a lot of cosmology, it's about the intrinsic value of the discovery itself, about learning about how it all works. Of course, with the whole details are hard to understand thing, most of us don't get the intellectual satisfaction or the applied technological advances. But when it is a big enough discovery, physicists and science communicators who love them really put in the effort to break it down for us. And if you need any indication of the magnitude of this week's gravitational wave discovery, look at how much they're doing to get this information out to us in an explain like I'm five manner. And I need that. Einstein hypothesized their existence back in 1916, but gravitational waves weren't empirically confirmed until 2015, so most of us got through our whole science educations before they were even something to include in the curriculum. So today, we're going to review what gravitational waves are, explain why they're back in the news eight years after that 2015 discovery, and figure out what we learned from all this anyway. Just popping in. From Lots our little human level. perspective, physics is bizarre and counterintuitive at very small and very large scales. So physicists end up relying on a whole lot of metaphors of varying levels of silliness. Here's bowling ball on a trampoline, which describes how mass distorts spacetime. Roll this abnormally large marble across the trampoline, it's gonna roll toward the dip made by the bowling ball, right? The fabric of space-time works similarly, as massive objects distort the fabric around them, creating wells of gravity that impact the motion of objects around them. And everything in space is moving. The universe has no purple part of the trampoline where a marble could just chill. And there's no place on the black part of the trampoline where the marble wouldn't move. In fact, actual space has a bunch of different marbles and bowling balls of different sizes all moving around. And we can imagine the marble accelerating as it gets closer to a bowling ball. Those changes in speed are the metaphorical equivalent of uh, changes in acceleration that produce grav waves as those changes in speed cause ripples in the trampoline of space-time. Is it a perfect metaphor? No. And I could throw like three others at you, each imperfect in their own way, to approximate different aspects of how grav waves work. <laughs> Look, it turns out space-time isn't actually a trampoline, but it gets us some measure of the picture. Anyway. Why are these ripples so hard to detect? Well, it takes a lot of mass to have a detectable gravitational effect on anything, like a lot. For reference, let's talk about what it took to detect gravitational waves back in 2015 with the LIGO instrumentation. LIGO detected grav waves produced by two supermassive black holes spiraling toward each other, creating the marble toward the bowling ball acceleration that produces grav ripples a billion light years away and ultimately colliding. That is gravitational power unlike anything nearby us. Thank goodness. And those supermassive black holes are more like freaking boulders than bowling balls as graph wells go. And yet, here's what it took LIGO to detect grav waves from that event. It took a megawatt of laser power because more powerful lasers have proportionally fewer fluctuations in the number of photons. Yes, we're in the number of photons is relevant sensitivity territory for this instrumentation. It took the smoothest mirrors ever invented 
so fluctuations couldn't be attributed to the mirror's surface. And it took two four kilometer vacuum envelope arms set perpendicular to each other at in two different identical facilities across the United States in order to account for earthborne noise. All to detect wiggles, one ten thousandth of the width of a proton. As the gravitational wave passes through the Earth, space stretches in one direction while compressing in the perpendicular direction, meaning that one of the arms is longer than the other because space is stretched along that arm, then they swap back and forth as the wave passes through our space. As the length of the arms change, the laser light from the stretched arm has to travel a farther distance than the compressed arm, which changes the interference pattern between the electromagnetic waves produced by these chonky lasers. Hence, the name interferometer used by this instrument. Interferometers, as such, were designed in the 19th century, but with the precision required for fractions of the width of a proton measurements? Yeah, no, no. No wonder you need ultra smooth mirrors and mega lasers and four kilometer arms and all that. It's amazing that a setup like that can even detect a phenomenon so small. And remember, that's to detect the ripples of two supermassive black holes crashing into one another. You know, a really, really big thing. Of course, that big crash was far, far away, so the inverse square law comes into play here. If two yachts crash into each other, they're going to create a big splash where they are, but... If my wave detector is thousands of kilometers away, I only detect a little splishlet, if anything. So once again, we're asking, what's the difference between what LIGO found back then and what's got physicists giddy now, and why couldn't LIGO detect it? Well, LIGO's instrumentation is optimized to detect the big crash of stellar remnant black hole binaries. <clears throat> which, as a phenomenon, lasts no more than a few seconds. And so the LIGO detectable waves are only a couple minutes long. As grav waves go, these are high frequency waves with wavelengths as short as 1800 miles long. What got physicists giddy this week involved low frequency graph waves with wavelengths measured up to <clears throat> light years. Light years. Yeah, there was absolutely no chance the four kilometer arms on LIGO were big enough to detect a light year size low amplitude wavelength. That right there is why this is a novel finding compared to 2015. After all, in the electromagnetic spectrum, Herschel discovered infrared radiation in 1800, Hertz demonstrated radio waves in 1886, microwaves in 1888, Röntgen proved radio waves in 1895, and Villard identified gamma rays in 1900, and all the whole time, we weren't like, oh, well, pfft, how is this a new discovery? They're all on the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Our 2015 graph waves have a wavelength of 3,000 kilometers, and this year's have a wavelength of like nine and a half trillion kilometers. We've been busting our brains trying to get an intuitive handling of the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire, and this is thousands versus trillions. There you go. That's why this isn't a rehash. This is an extremely different hash. Congratulations. Science contained. Come on, when a graph wave is stretching and compressing space on this scale, you could build an interferometer the size of the whole Earth and it wouldn't do the job properly. I mean, if LIGO's waves, which are a big, noticeable, high-frequency crash, still required literally reinventing the mirror, you gotta wonder a little bit. How the heck astrophysicists managed to measure 
these low frequency graph boys. Well, hear me out. What if we just use the whole galaxy? No, seriously, stay with me. Across our galaxy are dozens and dozens of pulsars. Nature's lighthouse, which spin hundreds of times per second, emitting beams of electromagnetic radiation. They are weirdly, weirdly reliable in their pulse interval, around the millisecond to second range. We actually use pulsar data pretty early on in grav wave research. Before LIGO, way back in 1974, we measured grav waves indirectly from the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar, whose weirdly reliable intervals changed as the pulsar and neutron star orbited around their common center of mass. The usually reliable pulse variation changed with a consistent period of 7.75 hours, which was in turn consistent with a loss of energy due to gravitational waves from interacting with its neutron star mate, as predicted by Einsteinian general relativity. But that's one pulsar, producing its own grav waves as part of its binary orbit. Imagine if you were looking at all those dozens of pulsars, and you watched one star's pulse vary, then another, light years away, and another, as a grav wave stretches and compresses space across the galaxy and thereby changes the distance that each pulsar's light has to travel to reach us. That's at least the basic idea behind how pulsar timing arrays work, the instrumentation and methodology we use to detect low frequency grav waves. This recent discovery is the product of a massive collaboration between three radio observatories that modern monitored 67 pulsars, gathering data on their timing over 15 years as they processed time of arrival variations between each pair of pulsars in the data set. So like 2,211 distinct pairs. One of the three observatories, by the way, is actually Arecibo, which was destroyed in early 2020 and collapsed in December of that year. The telescope contributed half of Nanograv's pulsar sensitivity, the consortium behind this low frequency graph wave project. And this is part of its ongoing legacy as its decades of archived data continue to contribute to new discoveries, even after the facility itself is tragically no longer with us. But a bunch of variations in pulsar timing turn out to be mundane. Pulsar timing changes if there's interstellar dust between there and here, similar kind of disruptions. As with everything in science, statistical significance is the key. And a bunch of these, the ones that ultimately are signal processing prodigies were able to infer and gather from said data are still there. And yet it is worth noting that these findings are just the slightest bit short of the five sigma threshold of statistical significance that is the gold standard in this corner of physics. The there's a one in a million shot that these data are this way purely by chance. That said, the nanograv project that produced this discovery is still ongoing. Today, 79 pulsars are being observed with over half a million time of arrival data points thus far. And with the combined data from the multiple observatories in the consortium, the nanograv team hopes to accumulate enough data to reach that threshold within the next year or two. But other than, yay, Einstein was right again. What do these discoveries tell us and why does this project continue gathering data? Hmm? One, to reach that statistical significance threshold. But what this whole project tells us is that grav waves exist beyond just the big crashy kind. The low frequency gravitational waves reported this past week don't identify any particular source. 
they've been framed as background gravitational radiation, namely waves coming from various sources throughout the galaxy. One hypothesis is that the hum of background gravitational waves indicate there are many supermassive black hole binary systems, which makes sense. If we go back to our trampoline, we can imagine bowling balls clumping together over time. What the pulsar timing array captures is not the gravitational signal of the collision between these massive objects and binary systems like LIGO might measure, but rather the ripples that come from their spirals toward each other. In other words, we now know that background grav waves, faint though they are to detect, are very much a part of our space-time environment, and hopefully, as we learn more about detection and signal processing, we will be able to use these data to learn about the gravitational interactions between large bodies, including other types of gravitational waves, and study them in ways that electromagnetic spectrum equipment, like our traditional telescopes, cannot. Which will hopefully give us new tools to learn about the early universe and about the parts of our galaxy we can't see. All in all, I'd say that's pretty reasonable cause for the physicists to be giddy. Would you? <laughs>